Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, so my name is Go Kieda. I'm from uh, NUS Physics and Chemistry and Graphene Center. Um, so uh, title of my talk is Original Optical Transition in Semiconducting 2D Crystals. Um, I noticed that uh, most of the stuff that we've done are already sort of available in the poster session, and my postdocs and the students are, uh, have already presented. So, and also many of the other things that we are trying to do or we've done are sort of already uh, presented yeah, during, this, uh, during this workshop. So uh, there's not much left for me to say, but I'll try to put everything in context and say, uh, you know, try to show uh, what, we are, what we are trying to do and where we are headed. Um, so I'd like to start with the acknowledgement, acknowledging my group members. Uh, here's an old picture of our, of our group. Um, we now have uh, more, well, actually a couple of postdocs left and the new, new ones joined. But we have a new member um, and we have collaborators within Graphene Center and outside. Um, it's uh, very nice to have colleagues who are within the Graphene Center who can be your lunch buddies and always discuss what you do. Um, and also, so, so the, the, the things I'm going to talk about are mostly on projects that are done in collaboration with uh, Professor Matsuda from Kyoto University and also Professor uh, Ricardo Ribeiro, from, uh, who was a visiting professor from University of Minho. <coughs> and I'd like to acknowledge a generous funding from uh, National Research Foundation uh, and Graphene Center. So, um, I think this has been already said many times, but this is, uh, I think, what many of us are inspired by. Um, the fact that you have uh, dramatic change in the optical properties of uh, these uh, layer compounds when you thin it down to the uh, individual monolayers. So left, left hand side is uh, exfoliate sheets of tungsten sulfide, sulfide and quartz, and right hand side is the fluorescence image of the same region, and you see that single layer region is the one that's fluorescent. And so, um, so I've always been very fascinated by the fact, by these dramatic changes in the uh, electronic structure. Um, so we could, one way to look at it is to say um, this could be used for something, but the other way to think about it is to say we can use this as a probe to study the uh, electronic properties of uh, these 2D crystals. Uh, because what uh, differentiates 2D crystals from other many other nanomaterials are the fact that I think is that uh, the dispersion, you still have the dispersion within the plane and that dispersion is the one that's changing when you do whatever to, to it by either applying electric field or by putting another layer on top of it, uh, uh, another layer on top or when you, when you stretch it. So um, I think it's the dispersion that's, that's uh, very unique about 2D crystals and how we can manipulate them. <coughs> so. Um, I'll study uh, the basic properties of these, uh, the, the dispersion in 2D crystals um, using PL as our primary tool to probe them. So uh, here's just the spectra of uh, PL from uh, tungsten sulfide, a different number of layers. And we, know, we now know that it's not only MOS2 or tungsten sulfide, but every uh, group six semiconducting uh, layer caucasianized show us a very nice strong PL when you thin it down to a, a single layer. And we more or less know at where this comes from and uh, where the absorption features also come from. Anyhow, uh, here's the outline of my talk. Uh, first part, I'll say briefly about charge transport in CBD grown and monolayer MOS2. Now this very nice CBD technique is available and uh, we can get hands on this material. So I think it's the first check to do a first quality check to to test, I think it's the first step to see if the CBD materials are very good enough, comparable to the exfoliated material or not. So this was done by uh, my postdoc, Henrik Schmidt. Um, second part is, uh, will be to study the uh, conduction band structure of few layer um, TMDs. Uh, this was done by uh, Wei Jie Zhao. Um, third part will be, I'll be looking at the the interesting absorption features of, uh, of MOS2 and different TMDs and how that would, um, what sort of information it tells us about the carrier relaxation pathways and dynamics. 
and at the end, I'll, I'll talk about I'll talk a little bit about what uh, what we did almost three years ago um, uh, with uh, uh, these MOS exfoliated chemically exfoliated MOS2 and how we can use it for photo photoelectrochemical uh, light harvesting. So I'll start with the first part. So as you might have seen in the poster, um, so we based on uh, on the, these uh, techniques that were developed by several groups around the world, especially Columbia and Rice Group, to grow uh, monolayer MOS2 by CBD, we can, we're able to also reproduce the results and, um, uh, and find that these are indeed a very nice, apparently these are nice quality MOS2, monolayer MOS2. And uh, we wanted to, I think, first line approach is to just say, you know, just to see the qual just to check the quality by either optically or by charge transport. So we grew these crystals, and if you look at this under a uh, fluorescence microscope, you can see sort of a zoo of different crystals with different uh, defects, uh, grain boundaries. But uh, we try to um, pick up the ones that seem to have a uh, small number of grain structures, grain boundary structures, uh, use and uh, contacted them by, by e-beam and studied the charge transport. Here's the PL signatures of uh, CBD and exfoliated samples. The black one shows the CBD sample, which is uh, much narrower. And these are um, normalized PL, but uh, if you actually see the actual PL intensity, then the CBD sample is about 20 times stronger in intensity compared to the exfoliated samples. So that's it's the first indication that these are reasonably good crystals. Um, so we took these crystals. Uh, we actually had to transfer them onto a new fresh substrate before we could do the transport because this, the oxide seemed to have been uh, compromised during the growth somehow. So we transferred them, etched them, contacted them, um, and then studied the uh, electrical properties. So <clears throat> um, the quick conclusion, actually, uh, before going into too much in detail, the quick conclusion is that we didn't see anything that was so much different from the exfoliated samples in terms of the mobility, um, uh, yeah, in terms of mobility and temperature dependence. Uh, but we were able to get some more information uh, during, during this uh, study. So here's a typical sample of mobility of about 30 at room temperature. Um, but the crucial step uh, turned out to be, similar to what the, the I think, MIT group were, was uh, uh, this uh, reporting, was that if you anneal it, anneal these samples uh, in vacuum for a very long time, you, um, you improve their conductivity by quite a lot. <clears throat> so here's a, here's a change in conductance as a function of annealing time. So if you anneal it, the conductance goes up um, as you go up to uh, 400 Kelvin. And when we, stop, when we stop the annealing and then when we cool down to 300 Kelvin, the actually conductance actually further increases uh, sort of the, uh, the temperature dependence here is already reversed here. So here, temperature, the conductance increases with the temperature. Here, conductance increases with decreasing temperature. Anyhow, that's uh, the resulting transfer characteristics is that uh, the whole curve, whole transfer for curve shifts about more than 100 uh, volt um, towards the left. So that sort of corresponds to almost about 10 to, um, 10 to 12 uh, doping densities um, that happened during this annealing process. Yes. Have you or others tried a different uh, annealing uh, ambient? We tried annealing in nitrogen. The same thing doesn't happen, actually, uh, as far as we know. So there's some very, very slow diffusion of maybe water or something, because this is a reversible process. If you put it out in air, this threshold shifts all the way back to the, to the right. So some diffusion of, uh, I think, water or oxygen is happening. So are you uh, saying that it's not uh, sensitive to the ambient gas? It, it is very sensitive to the ambient. So, so we, uh, after annealing, you have to make the measurement right away to, uh, to have it in this state, it, in this high, highly doped state. Um, but anyhow, uh, here's the annealing effect in terms of conductance as a function of temperature and gate, back gate voltage. Um, so uh, initially, the highly conducting state is only achieved um, over here at highest gate voltages, where the highest, the lowest uh, channel resistance was about 25 kilo ohms. After annealing, uh, the overall temperature dependence also changes, which I'll discuss in the next slide. 
uh, but the highest conductance we, or resi low, lowest resistance we could achieve was about five kilo ohms. And actually, we we did further studies with uh, using higher doping, and we, we found that we can we can uh, decrease the decrease the um, channel resistance by another order of magnitude. Um, but anyhow, the the story is that uh, there's no actually there's no new physics or anything to this. It, it, we, all we are saying is that we see the same thing as the exfoliate samples uh, by annealing threshold shifts and we can access a very high conducting region which hasn't been seen by uh, most other groups um, because typically most other groups report the resistance, the conducting regime below 10 kilo ohm, uh, above 10 kilo ohms um, or about above maybe 20 or 25 kilo ohms which means that most of the reported studies are seen in this regime where the conduction is, is due to hopping. But uh, just because we anneal the sample and shifted the, uh, shifted the threshold so much, we are able to see this region uh, where the tra transport is more, more uh, uh, band-like. <coughs> so, um, so we can access this region. And the, actually, if you, if you see this very closely, and if you look at the derivative of this, um, you notice that the slope almost saturates at the lowest temperature um, when, you, when you go to high gate voltages. <clears throat> so this is the only region where we see linear change in conductance as a function of gate voltage. Um, so unless you really start accessing this regime, the, the, the conductance is never linear with, with the gate voltage. Um, so anyhow, what this means, so here the condu uh, conductance is saturated with gate voltage and temperature which seems to suggest that, uh, you know, so, so we have density and temperature independent mobility, which is indication of short range scattering because the conductance, you can write it in this form um, and KF. Um, so, the, so, so the mean free path is proportional to KF because the, uh, the scattering time is, is constant for 2D crystals with a short range scatterer. So if you have, you have KF over here, KF over here is a K squared and conductance is linear with uh, doping uh, with N, and that seems to uh, suggest that we have short range scatterers on top of ch uh, charge impurity scattering. So uh, I think these things have to be taken into account for future sort of further studies of um, sort of uh, looking at the phonon, if the real phonon effect, uh, because typically these things are sort of not uh, taken into account in temperature analysis. Anyhow, so I'll just uh, leave this part with that, and then going to the second part, <coughs> which is also outside in the, in the poster. Um, but I'll also, I just want to uh, uh, point out a few uh, subtle features of the band structure. So we, I guess we don't need to review this many times, but in the conduction band, um, besides the uh, valleys at the K point, uh, we have valleys along uh, at, at, uh, at the lambda point, which is along gamma K line. <coughs> so it, uh, the valleys are not only at the corners of the brilliant zone, but we also, ha we al also have the valleys uh, elsewhere. And, uh, and it's also not only at the lambda point. But anyhow, you have two valleys in the conduction band, and you have also two hills in the valence band. You have a big hill in the, in the gamma point, big hill at the K point. And we know that for bulk crystals, this lambda point is, is low, uh, this gamma point is high, so you get the indirect gap between the, between the lambda valley and the gamma hill. But if you have a single layer, um, these hill, while well, this lambda valley is much higher, lambda, uh, the gamma hill is much lower. So the gap is between the K points. Oops. So, um, oops, sorry. Okay. So, yeah, I think that's, a, that's what I wanted to say. Um, so again, so the, the evolution of the band structure happens when you go from one layer to two layers, three layers, as we already discussed. Um, but uh, the, I, was, I wanted to get the pictorial view of what's happening and why it is that we get this uh, evolution of the band structure. Um, if you look at the, the wave functions associated with the K point of the band structure, we see that in, these are mainly the D electrons of the transition metals whether you're at the conduction band or the valence band. If, but if you look at the gamma point, you start to have some of these uh, p orbital uh, contributions. And also at the lambda point, you also have, especially at the lambda valley, 
you have the p orbital contributions. So if you look at qualitatively, you can see it as that um, the region of the band structure which is susceptible to the neighboring layer are the ones that con contains the p orbital contributions. So this lambda valley, uh, gamma hill, are the ones that are very susceptible to what you have in the, in the next layer. And that seems to make sense because these p orbitals are just outside the, outside the layers. Um, so based on this, so we can look at the PL spectrum of tungsten sulfide, tungsten selenide, um, and we see that for single layers, we have strong single peak on top of these, uh, well, uh, hot electron peaks. Um, and then you have, and when you ha whenever you have more than two layers, you have the indirect emission peak, which sort of disperse with um, increasing number of layers. And that um, suggests that these uh, gamma hill and lambda valleys are the ones that are really moving with the increasing number of layers. Um, but the question is, um, if, you have these more than, if you have more than two layers, you have this indirect emission, ind indirect transition, on top of the direct transition, which is happening at the k-point, um, we don't know exactly which indirect emission peak which we, we are seeing, because you could have k to gamma, or um, lambda to gamma, or lambda to k. And uh, typically what experimentalists do is that we take the experimental um, observation, we look at the band structure calculations done by theorists, and then say, okay, this is the lowest energy, so this must be what's happening. This must be the transition that we are seeing. Um, but the problem is that if we see the, the DFT calculations in different papers, uh, different people say different things, and this is because I guess the recipe for the uh, DFT calculation is different for different people. Uh, for example, in this paper, the conduction band minimum is happening at the lambda point. Here, the conduction minimum is at the k point. And roughly speaking, half of the papers are saying it's the conduction band minimum is at the k, and half of the papers are saying conduction minimum at the lambda point. And that sort of confused us for, for a while, and that, um, that was a question which value is the conduction band minimum? And this seemed to be a relatively a trivial question, and maybe you don't care about it so much, but uh, I guess it's an important question to answer because the effective mass associated with these, these values are very different. I think the, K, um, the electrons at the K point is much lighter. So uh, if you have a bilayer sample, and if you're making uh, transport measurements, I guess it's very important to see whether you're injecting electrons into the, into the K valley or into the lambda valley. So uh, that's what we want to know, and um, I guess that we cannot only rely on the DFT calculations, so uh, we have to think of some other way. Um, some similar problems uh, were, had been encountered, I know, uh, in the 2D, uh, 2 deg um, community, where, for example, in gallium arsenide, you have, a, you have, a, you have the valley at, at the lambda po uh, L point and the and X point, and it's been a long debate which value is actually lower. So I guess uh, you know, this sort of very basic understanding of where the, valley conduction band, well, where the valleys are located with respect to your conduction band minimum is, uh, is uh, I think, basic in, um, information to uh, clarify. So what we, what we did is to, uh, rather than to take the absolute values from the calculations, we, t we saw the trends. So I think, but this is uh, as uh, we had talks in the earlier today, um, we looked at the changes in the energy, transition energies as a function of the lattice parameters. So uh, first we see what happens if you change the lattice parameters this way. So in plane expansion, <coughs> so all the transition energies, well, all the gaps will close, everything will, will close. And this, everyone agrees. Um, so wherever you are. Actually, mostly, the most changes are happening at the k-point because the k is very um, uh, responsible for the in-plane bond. Um, but uh, but any, anyhow, the transition energy, the energy gap is closing with increasing a lattice parameter. If you take the same thing, if you change the lattice parameter this way, or increase the interlayer spacing, then uh, the k-point doesn't change so much, but the lambda point and the gamma point will shift. So the lambda point goes up, the k gamma point will go down. And this is also something that everyone agrees. Um, but in real, uh, in real life, when we 
do the experiments, the easiest way to tune these uh, parameters is to just simply heat the sample. And because, the, because there's a strong uh, anisotropy nice in the thermal expansion coefficients, um, we can put it in these parameters, thermal expansion coefficient parameters, and then see which one dominates the transition, th th which one dominates which trends. So uh, it turns out that, so interestingly, um, the K to K transition always sort of, um, well, K to K energies will always uh, decrease with, well, with increasing lattice parameter or increasing temperature. Um, but uh, the energy difference between the, between the lambda valley and the gamma hill and the K valley and the gamma hill will, will show different trends because essentially it's just the composite of what, what's happening here, but always one of them wins so that uh, one transition energy will go up with, with temperature, one transition energy will go down with temperature. So this can be used as a signature to identify which transitions that we are looking at. So uh, this is actual experimental uh, data. So uh, for if you take bilayer MOS2, we see two peaks of the usual axons from the K point and then the indirect emission peak. We, you can follow this uh, shift of the peak. So the indirect emission peak energy would increase with increasing temperature, which suggests that, okay, we are looking at lambda to gamma, well, lambda valley to gamma hill transition. Uh, similar, to, uh, similar to MOS2, we have w, uh, double bilayer WS2. We see uh, uh, increase in the indirect transition energy peak with increasing temperature. So again, this is lambda to gamma. Uh, if you take WSE2 bilayer, um, then we see an uh, opposite uh, temperature dependence for the indirect transition, which suggests that we are looking at you know, K to gamma transition rather than lambda to K. Uh, lambda to gamma. And uh, so we went, went ahead just to verify further uh, what happens if we go to uh, three layer and four layer WSC2. So we have three, four, eight layer WSC2. And now we started to see not only one indirect transition energy, but also two indirect uh, emission peaks with a different temperature dependence. So one peak is going up with temperature, another peak is going down with temperature. So these uh, distinct features <coughs> seem to uh, verify that, okay, you have a um, lambda to gamma transition for, uh, and also, and uh, K to gamma transition. My anyway, the summary for this part is that if you take bilayer MOS2 and WS2, the conduction, minim ban conduction band minimum is at the lambda point. But if you have bilayer WSE2, then the conduction band minimum is at the K point. And this seems to be very subtle, but I think we're very uh, um, excited to see that there are actually subtle differences between different uh, uh, compounds. So uh, that was the second part. Um, third part is looking at the uh, band nesting effects that Antonio talked about um, in the previous session. So <coughs> this is um, absorption spectrum uh, of graphene and single layer MOS2 obtained using uh, differential reflectance measurement. So we place a sample on quartz and look at the white light reflection. Um, and we can, we can relate the uh, differential reflectance to the absorption using this simple formula. Um, and uh, for graphene, so these are measured under the same exact conditions. For graphene, we get the usual 2.3% absorption. Um, but for MOS2, uh, we get actually very strong absorption at the A and B extonic uh, resonance and huge, huge absorption at the very high energy. And um, I guess the, the, the actual numbers uh, have to be sort of taken with, uh, with care because you know, this may not be exactly correct. Uh, uh, may not give you the exact absorption. But in any case, um, I, since graphene is, we get reasonably good value for graphene, um, we, we can at least say that the absorbance at this part of the spect energy spectrum is, is huge for single layer MOS2. So, um, um, so large fraction of, of photons that go in with this energy is really absorbed by the sample. And, and uh, if we are thinking about some device applications or photovoltaic applications, um, we would want to know where these carriers are going, photocarriers are going, and if we can ever harvest them. 
Um, so uh, as uh, Antonio talked about, so we can see the, uh, this strong absorption can be due to, well, is likely to be due to the band nesting or the parallel band effects. <coughs> Um, so what happens is, the, is that the optical conductivity sort of blows up when you have the uh, well, same slope for same gradient for E at the conduction band and the valence band. Um, so we know what's happening around the K point, um, but uh, at higher energies, the high strong absorption seems to be coming from this, uh, this region of the band structure. So the question is, um, what happens to the carriers that are absorbed uh, in resonance in, with this energy. Um, you can see that if you excite carrier there, um, the electron in holes would ha would should uh, decay to the immediate valley or immediate hill. So electron in holes should go to, uh, should, uh, should relax to a different, different region of the uh, phase space. So uh, they can still form an exon, but they are indirect exon, which means that they you need, them f uh, or you need a phonon uh, to, to have them recombine. Um, so, but you can, you can, of course, they can, they can relax all the way down to the K point, but that also requires some phonons. Uh, this hole can also relax to the K point, but this also requires phonons, and the probability of them, these indirect exons, radiated with recombining, will be low. Um, so to check that, we, uh, we did the, uh, we, used, um, uh, we used a white light laser with a tunable filter to do a photoluminescence excitation spect spectroscopy. So here's the PL uh, intensity um, as a f with, a, with different excitation energy. So uh, if you just look at this, there's not, nothing much interesting because if you, as long as you are above, exciting above the optical gap of this material, you just get PL at the band edge. But if you look at the PL uh, intensity uh, or PL, uh, PLE spectrum along this emission, um, this is what we see. So the optical contrast, which is, well, uh, which is proportional to the absorption, goes up significantly at very high energy, well, at 2.8 electron volt. But the PL intensity will decrease with increasing energy, excitation energy. Which seems to suggest that, uh, which seems to suggest that again, you know, you, you're exciting electron hole pairs with different, which which are relaxing, achieving different uh, momentum. So uh, their chances of the chances of them radi radiatively recombining will be low, and therefore you get very low PL. Um, and this seems to be also true for uh, actually any any other single layer uh, TMDs. So this is a single layer MOSC2, same story. Uh, you have very strong absorption peak at about 2.6, 2.7 electron volt, but the PL intensity sort of gradually decreases as you, go in, uh, as you increase the uh, excitation energy. So, <coughs> uh, so the story is that uh, the electron will, will be relaxing down to this lambda valley, holes will stay at the gamma valley, and while they are sort of thinking, what they want to do, um, they get captured by some trap states and then you lose them. Um, <laughs> so, because the time scale for them being trapped is actually very, very fast and uh, that's very competing with the uh, indirect emission peak. So, uh, anyhow, this is very um, um, inefficient process. Uh, the rated, rated recombination will be in inefficient because it's very slow and the trap the non-radiative component will always dominate, <coughs> and uh, these guys also relaxing down all the way to the K point will be, uh, will be low. So what happens to bilayers, because when you have bilayer MOS2, you have a valley at the lambda point, and you have a hill, conduction band valley, minimum valley at the lambda point, valence band hill at the gamma point, and those are the points where the electrons and holes would relax down to. So, um, we see a different thing uh, in case of bilayer. So, um, okay, so, so we see indirect emission peak, direct emission peak, and with this, with, as a function of excitation energy, um, the indirect emission peak intensity increases with uh, excitation energy, while the uh, direct emission peak sort of decreases well, with only a little hump. So these are the actual um, 
intensities, and you can see that the indirect emission peak and direct emission peaks, they have different uh, ratios depending on the excitation energy. And that, uh, the ratio between the indirect emission peak and the direct emission peak is highest when you are exciting at the, at the resonance condition. Um, so again, uh, this is not very clear, but the indirect emission peak has a peak when you have an uh, absorption peak. That uh, seems to suggest that um, the, indeed the electrons are decaying down to the lambda valley, and uh, this time you, don't have, you have less number of uh, um, relaxation channels. Um, so, um, so same to the previous case, where you have the uh, non-radiative com component dominating, uh, but you still have the indirect emission peak increasing because, uh, because the lambda point is at the conduction band minimum and gamma point is at the valence band maximum. So, um, so what does this all mean? So this seems to uh, mean that when you have a single layer, um, when you have a single layer, let me go back, when you have a single layer, um, and if you're, if you're in a perfect crystal, and assuming that this non-radiative component is not so strong, then the electrons and holes, they, they achieve different, they go to the different region of the phase space, and then they sort of think while they, uh, uh, before they, they are lost, they, before they go to the K point. So, uh, although this is a direct gap material, uh, before we lose them as uh, radiatively, we, can, we have some, some time to, uh, to extract them. So, in a way, this is to say that you have these hot electrons, which is uh, giving us some time to collect what before they, uh, before they are uh, lost as light. Um, so, so anyway, so that was, uh, so that was about this uh, uh, band nesting. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about this uh, photoelectrochemical light harvesting, which is somewhat related to what I just talk, talked about, because uh, this hot electron light uh, hot electron harvesting, there may be some evidence uh, of uh, a hot electron uh, extraction in, in these experiments that we did a long time ago. <coughs> so uh, these layer compounds are actually very well known to be stable, uh, good uh, photoelectrochemical anode uh, for, uh, for solar cell devices, and um, because they form very nice interface between, between um, with an electrolyte. So if you put in contact with an electrolyte, have a, have a counter electrode you know, um, and shine light to the, to the surface of the, of the compounds, then uh, you can, the electron go to, um, sorry, the electron would go to, go to uh, your electrode. The holes go, will be, will, will oxidize your, the, um, the electrolyte. You complete the circuit and you generate some current when you shine light. <coughs> so this is an old idea and there's been a lot of work on this. And, uh, um, even before I was born, I guess, uh, people achieved very high um, energy conversion efficiency using uh, tungsten selenides and molyselenide. So these, I guess, I, um, these are very interesting, um, nice system to work with, uh, but somehow these, uh, not, not many people pursue this, this area. So when we were looking into the chemical exfoliation of, uh, of these, Layered, um, and we, we are looking at how to make, you know, uh, making we, 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 when we are putting efforts into making nice thin films out of these exfoliated sheets. Uh, we thought of taking these and using using them as the uh, photo anodes for these photoelectric chemical solar cells. So, uh, so we can exfoliate them using lithium intercalation. This is an old idea. Um, have a colloidal solution in water filter them, you have a thin film, scoop them, and you can take nice photographs and uh, um, use them as, the, as some electrode or study their properties in their ultimate thickness regime. So this is what we did. You simply coated the uh, FTO substrate uh, with, you, with this uh, thin, very, very thin layers of MO, exfoliated MOS2 and uh, put, put them in an electrolyte, shine light, and see if we generate any current. And we do generate some current, <coughs> um, especially, particularly at the, uh, uh, at the extonic resonance point. So you have these two peaks in the photocurrent. 
Um, and this seemed to work reasonably well as a photo. No, actually, this doesn't work very well as a, as a solar cell because if you see the numbers, the, uh, the IPC, um, well, the actually uh, one out of maybe 10,000 photons that go in will give you some current. So this is actually very horrible in a way, but um, we, we, we had some ideas, which is to use these, uh, uh, well, exfoliate sheets to sensitize wider band gap material. So this, I took the idea from the quantum dot community. So there, there are some ideas to use uh, quantum dot, cadmium solenoid, quantum dot sensitize um, titanium uh, oxide surfaces, use them as a sensitizer, you know, have them uh, absorb light, pass the electron onto the wide gap semiconductors and then extract light that way. So we thought, okay, we have these exfoliate sheets, um, can we use them as a sensitizer of, for TiO2? So we just uh, exfoliated them, mixed the paste, and saw if we, uh, if we could get uh, anything uh, out of this type of electrode. So this is the composite of, uh, of the film. So now, um, this is not actually so much better, <laughs> unfortunately, but this is something, there's something interesting about this because uh, we know based on the photoelectrochemical, uh, well, um, well, potential measurements that the conduction band edge of uh, MOS2 is sitting below the conduction band minimum of titanium oxide, TiO2. So if you are exciting in, in resonance uh, with the, well, A extons, then the electrons cannot go into, cannot be injected into TiO2. Um, however, so, so, okay, so that, that's what, what this, is, this is seeing, this is showing. So uh, in this composite, uh, you don't get any photocurrent when you're exciting in resonance with the ex, uh, band gap extonic uh, peaks. But if you're um, exciting above at the, in this uh, nesting region, then we started to get some current. <clears throat> but we would expect that when we excite at this nesting region, those would, those would decay directly down to the K, um, K point, and then the, again, this would be lost uh, somewhere. But uh, this is not the case. So when we, when we excite the sample at this uh, nesting region, we get re reasonably large photocurrent, which which indicates that those hot electrons are actually in being injected into uh, the TiO2. So um, this seems to uh, sort of uh, agree reasonably well with what, uh, what I was mentioning earlier in terms of the band nesting, how they, how they spend some extra time at the, uh, in these valleys before they, uh, they are lost as, as light or um, in some trap state. Okay, so here's the summary of, uh, of my talk. So the initial part I said, the CVD MOS2 uh, are very good or bad, or as good as the exfoliate sample or as bad as the exfoliate sample. Um, but we really need to take care of the, uh, of the uh, conduction, band, uh, conduction mechanism in order to uh, really improve their properties. Um, um, and the second part is, was about the conduction and balance band, well, conduction band structure using, looking at conduction band structure, valley structure using uh, simple, very simple temperature dependent PL. And um, this was actually, a, a, we thought this was very um, valuable information because, oh, I'm ri running out of time. <laughs> okay, because, uh, because there's not many technique to look at the dispersion in the conduction band. You can always use RPES to look at the valence band but it's, it's very hard to look at what's happening in the conduction band. And so this is a, a simple technique that we were able to use somehow indirectly, but to, to get information about the conduction band uh, minimum. And finally, I mentioned about this uh, very strong absorption due to uh, band nesting. And this seems to uh, indicate that loss of photocarriers due to direct recombination, the direct radiative recomb recombination is delayed and we have some extra time to buy before they are, they are lost. Okay, so uh, that's it. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>